free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the light. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven you conquer the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awaken the light oh jesus our savior your name lifted i oh god you have done great things hallelujah god Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, have done great things, oh yeah, hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, our name lifted I, oh, God have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for Jesus. <laughs> Welcome to church today. It's uh, always lovely to be in God's presence. I'm just going to read a quick scripture. Before we go on ahead, praising God, Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, The Lord appeared unto us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with my unfailing kindness. So for whatever you think you're going through, God will never let you go. God is always with you. He has loved you, and he's loved you because he is love, not because of the things that you do. So just hold on to that promise that he will never let go. Amen. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord. Never let go of me. And I can see a life 
that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond no compare and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes we'll live to know you're here on the earth never let go of us.
lift up your voice and give him glory. For he is worthy to be praised. His name with sound of singing. Lift up his name in all the earth. Lift up your voice and give him glory. For he is worthy to be praised. For he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. God is worthy to be praised. Now, uh, for every, every time that we come into God's presence, we come because there is an assurance that God will never change. His love is, always, his love is everlasting. The things that he says he will do, he will do. And so we're going to take a beautiful song right now, do it again, reminding ourselves that God will never change. He will do what he has said he will do. So whatever promise is given to you, he's definitely going to do it again. Amen. 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 Promise 
still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never Father, we thank you. Thank you for such an awesome promise that you will never fail us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Father, we thank you because we know that you're the only one that answers all prayers. Your word says, unto him that answer all the prayers of all flesh shall men gather. Father, we thank you because we're in your presence, knowing fully well that you are the only one person that will never fail. And so, God, we pray that as we are in your presence, that you will touch us afresh. You will heal us afresh. You will lift us afresh. So that in this week, as we go into the world, we, people will look at, at us and know that we have met with you in this service today. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Elam. Good to see you here, folks, this morning. Good to gather together and worship the Lord. Amen? And good just to open our hearts to the Lord and allow him to, to minister to our hearts today. I do have a few announcements this morning I want to share with you, but before I share my announcements, I owe you as a congregation a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, to the board for organizing that. Uh, that was a surprise party. Was that a surprise to you? No, that was a surprise to me. I didn't see that coming. Thank you uh, for the board for organizing that. Thank you for the cards and the gifts and the, the kind words. Um, as I said, uh, I didn't see that coming at all. I, I, it's interesting. I, um, it's not every Sunday that I'm looking for, for Ted and Marilyn, right? How many Sundays am I actually mentioning people? Where's Ted and Marilyn? There's Ted right here, Marilyn. Okay, so you're here. Great. So I saw you before the service, and I thought, I want to thank you for giving direction to the painting downstairs, and I could not find you in the service. I did not know you were setting up and getting ready for a surprise party. So uh, that, was, that was amazing. Um, I want you to know, thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, it's just an honor, I would say, just an honor for... Thelma and I, uh, to, to be able to pastor you, where we, we love you, uh, your family to us, we're family, and uh, I always think we're in this together, amen, we're building the kingdom together, there's no one man band here, and I just, uh, I, you know, it's coming up to 19 years, and the congregation's changed over the years, but just a great relationship, great bond, and I just feel very honored, we feel very honored to be here, and thank you so much. For, for blessing us in that way with that big number. But what's a number? What's a number, right? People tell me, what's a number? It doesn't matter. It's all downhill. Any oh, that's not downhill. <laughs> someone told me, yeah, someone told me when I turned 50, it's all downhill. And you remember what happened when I turned 51? I had a heart attack. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> Anyways, you know what? We're in the Lord's hands, and uh, we, every day is, is His. And so... Uh, to God be the glory. Let me mention a few announcements here. First of all, I have been announcing a special mortgage offering. Uh, we have set a goal for $10,000. Uh, we take that offering in the spring and the fall, and I'll just explain it to you for those of you that are fairly new in the church. Um, and this is giving that is giving over your regular tithes and your offerings. Um, and you can designate, of course, to the mortgage fund for this. And so why do we do this? Well, we have a mortgage of $107,000, and about, well, probably, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, we had a mortgage of $400,000, what's come down to $107,000, and how many are thankful that we did the addition to the church? I mean, when we, at least when we do things, you can see the change, you know? We renovated the sanctuary, that was a different project, that was all paid, really. Uh, you know, we had the money as it came in, we did it, but for the other project, we took that mortgage out. And so the reality is that um, people designate every month, they give towards the mortgage. We have a mortgage payment. 
How many have a mortgage payment? Okay, so how many know if you miss your payment, how many times? What happens? You lose your home, right? And so here's what happens here. We have a mortgage payment of $2,600 a month, and we get about $800 a month toward, designated towards the mortgage fund. And so we, we, we take from the general fund to subsidize the mortgage fund. That's what we do. And so what we do to compensate all of that, twice a year we have special offerings, and we give you an opportunity to give, and we use that to help us make those mortgage payments. And so that's just to make you aware of that. And if you'd like to give over and above your regular giving this morning, you can designate that on your envelope, or you could e-transfer that. Just say mortgage fund, and it will go directly to that. And so let's just take a moment, and let's just thank the Lord again for this privilege of, of investing his kingdom of giving. So, Lord, we thank you. Again, as we have mentioned many times, you could do this all by yourself, but you've chosen to work through people like us, Lord. And as we, we give, we talked about this last week, we give as a sacrifice, as unto you, as an act of worship because we love you. Not because we have to, we do it because we love you, but we also give because of vision, Lord, because there was a vision years ago to build an addition on this church, and there were a number of people that prayed and got together and thought about it and put plans together and set a budget. And, Lord, that was accomplished. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And, and you work through people in this church. And so, Lord, this is all about your kingdom. It's not about any person, personality. It's all about building your kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to our hearts this morning about what you'd like us to give. And, Lord, that we wouldn't give to that, recognizing that we're investing in your kingdom, that eventually we're working to pay that mortgage off and be able to free up funds, of course, for ministry. And so, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people in giving and investing sacrificially throughout the years. Bless, gift, and giver today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two more things I want to mention here. Uh, the, the next uh, announcement is that we do have a community prayer meeting once a month. We join with other churches. And, uh, and this month, actually tonight, there's a prayer meeting at the summit. And so there's a number of churches that get together. And so if you're available tonight from 5 to 6, I encourage you to go over to the summit. We spend in one hour in prayer, and it's just a great time to focus on the needs of our churches and the needs of our community. And so we just want to make you aware of this. Now, I'm going to th this next announcement... I'm just really shocked that I have to share this with you. I, I mean, it boggles my mind, but it's, it's the reality of what's in front of us. I want to talk about the manna ministry. Remember, just a few months ago, our, our, that room was empty. Remember I announced that? We need your help. Remember those words? Please help us because we had a lot of people coming get, getting hampers. And you graciously gave and gave and gave sacrificially to the point at which our room is full. To God be the glory. And so what that means, amen. So um, what that means for now, um, until we announce, I mean, and, and, and it's not, it, we, we don't know when people are coming. They call the church. Sometimes it's busy. Sometimes it's not. Uh, and so right now, we're not giving out quite as many hampers right now. And so we'll give it a few weeks. And, uh, and when we need some to replenish our room, I know. I'll just make an announcement and let you know. Okay? Is that fine? I'm just shocked to do that, but you don't know how many people are coming, and that room is full. So to God be the glory for great things he has done. It's wonderful to be able to touch people's lives. Of course, we give out hampers. They're, they're probably worth uh, $30, $40 or so with groceries. It's pretty heavy. Put a Bible, a New Hope magazine in there. Good opportunity to talk and to pray with people and listen to people, encourage them. So it's right frontline evangelism, and so that's wonderful to be able to do that. Amen. I invite you to stand again. We're going to sing one more song before I share the message this morning. The children can make their way downstairs. The song we're going to sing is Rock of Ages. How many people know that song? An old, old hymn. Great theology. Think about it when we sing it. Great theology. You almost have to have a Bible study to work it through, but it's great things. Rock of ages, clap for me, let me hide myself in thee. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. 
pray this morning. I just want to mention before we pray, uh, two prayer requests that we want to add to our prayer list in the bulletin. One is for Sven. Of course, Sven, uh, some of you may know, but Sven is heading down to Toronto this week, actually going for open heart. He went into the hospital this week, and they did an angiogram and, and discovered that he needed to uh, go for an open heart. So we want to pray for him, just waiting the next few days for an opening for him to fly him down. So let's pray for him, pray for his family. Elizabeth Bell, we know a number of you know Elizabeth Bell, she's been connected to the church. I understand that she was just moved into Arch uh, with some serious health issues, and so we need to pray for, for Elizabeth. So let's take a moment to pray for them, and for her, and for Stan, and for others. And so Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you're God, and you're in control, and there's Nothing that surprises you, and nothing's impossible with you, Lord. And so we would come to you, and Lord, we would pray on behalf of Sven, first of all, Lord, that you would keep your hand upon him, that, Lord, the doors would open soon here for him to be flown to Toronto and to go through this open heart. And, Lord, I pray your, your hand would be upon him, that, Lord, that you would give him great care and great recovery. We pray that your hand would be upon him in Jesus' name. He loves you. He's in your hand. You care for him. We think about Elizabeth, who has walked through some, a, a number of health issues throughout the years, and we pray that in this time in her life, Lord, we know that you could intervene on her behalf, and we do pray for that, and we also pray for Sven that you would heal him. We pray for him. We pray for Elizabeth, Lord, but we pray also you would be with her. And your hand would be upon her, and you give her strength and help, support, and be with her family, Lord. And Lord, we, we have other people we've been praying for. We continue to remember Jennifer, Lord, in prayer. We remember Marlene's sister, Lord, and Shirley, and Judy, Lord. We pray for her. We think of Elmer, Lord, who's in the hospital. And we think of Mildred, who's in the hospital, a number of people. And Richard, Lord, we pray for them that your hand would be upon them, that they would experience your healing touch in Jesus' name today. And so, Lord, as we open your word today, may we have ears to hear and a heart that responds to what you would want to say to us today. Minister to our heart, body, soul, and spirit. May we truly know that we've heard from the Lord today and you've spoke to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. 
And take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to Luke chapter 12. As we look into God's Word for the next few minutes, if you have a Bible, turn or your app, look in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, or uh, there will be scriptures that you'll find in your bulletin and also on PowerPoint as we talk about worry this morning. Nobody struggles with worry here, right? We're, no, we don't worry about anything at all. What, is your, what are you doing, Pastor? So here's a scripture verse for you. Uh, Jesus talks about worry. He said, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, was thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you eat, will eat or drink, and do not worry about it. For the, pagans, well, for the pagan world runs after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you as well. Well, one of the most uh, popular songs that came out uh, uh, of a famous Disney movie, The Lion King, a number of years ago, was called Akuna Matata. Remember? Akuna Matata, which is Swahili for no troubles or no worry. And part of the song I'm sure you're familiar with, it goes like this. I'm not going to sing it, and everybody said amen. <laughs> Akuna Matata ain't no passing craze. It means no worries for the rest of your days. It's our problem-free philosophy, akuna matata, akuna matata. And they, they came out a number of years. Our kids were younger. We watched that a number of times. And so that was one song that came out a few years ago. And there was also the, the, the song by Bar- Bobby McPherson. It was Don't Worry, Be Happy. You remember that one? Don't Worry, Be Happy. Uh, part of the words to that song, you have to have a little bit of beat to it. In every life, we have some trouble. When you worry, you make it double. Don't worry. Be happy. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody come and took your bed. Duh, don't worry. Be happy. Here's the third verse. Are you ready for it? The landlord say your rent is late. He might have to litigate. And then with the rest, don't worry. Be happy. Well, songs like these are easier sung than practice. The fact of the matter is, folks, is that all of us um, worry some of the time, and some of us worry all of the time, and we're not looking for a show of hands on that this morning. But Jesus said that, that we shouldn't worry. We shouldn't worry. And he addressed this topic of, of worry and anxiety head on here in chapter 12. So obviously Jesus is well aware of the human tendency for us to worry, to worry. And so here's where we're going this morning. We're going to attempt to answer three questions for you this morning. The first question is why, why do we worry? You thought about that? Why do I worry? Why am I worried? And the second question we're going to look at today is what do we typically worry about? And the last of all, we're going to talk about how we can deal with and fight against worry and deal with it so we're victorious in our, in our life. And so that's where we're going today as we walk through this. And so why do we worry? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we worry? We often worry about things, watch this, we cannot control, which means that most worry is really a control issue. It's a control issue, which then begs the natural question that, to that which is this, who or what? is in control of your life. Who or what is in control of your life? Now, as Christians, we go around and we say things like, God is in control of my life. God is in control. We like to declare how sovereign he is, and he is sovereign. 
But many times we as Christians go around saying, God is in control, but we live like life like, like we are, right? Like we're in control. And then when we are faced with situations that, watch this, that are beyond our control, what do we do? We start to worry. Isn't that how it works? That's how it works with me. The word worry, for those of you who are interested in the Greek, it's the word merim, merimneo, I'm probably not saying it right. The Greek word appears three times in this passage. In verse 22, worry. Verse 25 is worrying. And verse 26 is worry. And it's from a, a root word meaning to be distracted and divided. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Because when we worry, both of those things happen in our life. When we worry, we become distracted. Our, our minds become uh, flooded and preoccupied with everything we're worried about, and we lose focus on the things that are actually really important. I mean, I've discovered that. We lose sight of that, okay? So that's one area. So worrying also, another thing that worry does to us, it divides us because we become very conflicted in t internally. When we start to worry, our insides are in turmoil. And we become conflicted. And, and, and how have, you know, how, how have, and we have a hard time making decisions, and we don't know what to say or what to do because there's this internal divide. There's a conflict within our soul. And so we tend to worry because we feel like we're out of control instead of being in, under the control of the Holy Spirit. So essentially, so that's essentially, why do you worry? Because it's a control issue, and we want to be in control, but we have to learn somehow to give that control up to the Lord. We're going to see how we can do that. So that's the first thing I want to say this morning. The second question is, what do we typically worry about? When you look at the text in Jesus' day, there were two main areas of anxiety, which were over food. Imagine worrying over food and over clothing. This is what Jesus addresses there in verse 22 and verse 23. Listen to what he says. He says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for, for life is more than food and body more than clothes. Okay, so that's what he says. So those were the two main worries for the people of the day. We have to remember here, the first, this is first century. I mean, these were legitimate worries for them in the sense that they often didn't know where their next meal was coming from. So when they asked, what are we going to eat? It was often because they didn't have a pantry stocked with food. They didn't have a refrigerator stocked with food. They're just wondering from day to day, where their next meal was coming from. And so that was a legitimate first century worry. And they also had, had the worry about what, what are we going to wear because in those days, a lot of times, the only clothing that they owned was what they had on their backs. And so they had this, they had this worry of food and clothing. And so in order to try to help them and to give them peace and comfort and to minister to them, Jesus draws on two common everyday examples to help them understand how God loves them, how God will take care of them. That's exactly what they're doing here. The first thing that Jesus highlights there is in verse 24. He's going to use ravens as an example about their worry over food. And so he says these words, consider the ravens. He says, they do not so worry, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them, and how much more valuable are you than birds? And so Jesus is basically saying, you know, take a look at the ravens around you. Have you ever seen a neurotic raven? Well, maybe you have, if they're sick, I don't know. I haven't seen any neurotic ravens lately. You don't see a raven perched on a tree limb, you know, chewing on his bird claws going, where am I going to find food? You don't see that. Where's my next meal going to come from? You're not going to find that. Why? Because God takes care of them. That's what he's saying there. And then Jesus adds there in verse 24, and how much more valuable are you than the birds? And so that's kind of what he's saying. And then the second area of clothing, when they're saying, what should we, what should we, 
where Jesus draws on another common everyday example when he says, consider how the wild flowers or the lilies in King James Version grow, they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like these. And then he says, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown in the fire, how much more will he clothe you? And so that's first century thinking. And so let's translate this a little bit into Canada. Uh, 21st century, how does this relate to us? Because we also worry about what we're going to eat and, and what are we going to wear, but for different reasons than probably the first century people did. Today in the first century, for the most part, I mean, there are obvious pockets of poverty in our country, and it seems to be growing these days with the rise of inflation. There seems to be that going on. But for the most part, you know, when we ask the question, what are we going to eat? It's because we're standing in front of our stocked pantry or an overloaded refrigerator, and we're just wondering, what am I hungry for? What do I want to eat? That's what we mean, 21st century. Either that or you're in a restaurant with, you know, an, an overpriced, I should say this carefully, overpriced menu, and you're trying to figure out all the many choices. What am I going to eat? What am I, what am I hungry for? And so that's 21st century of, you know, asking that question regarding what you're going to eat. And, and when we ask the question, what am I going to wear, it's interesting in our day, we typically ask that question because we're standing in front of our clothes closet and we're looking at all these clothes, half of which we don't even wear or maybe don't fit, and we're wondering what's going to make me look the best and what's, what's the weather forecast for today? That's what we mean when we say what are we going to eat and what are we going to wear. Different mindset than the first century. Very different question in terms of the meaning of the first century verse uh, versus meaning today. And so what type of things do we worry about? So that's where we got to go. I mean, we, what do we worry about? What do you worry about? Well, I read some surveys, and here are some of the, the top seven, not necessarily in order, but there's a top, that they're the top main things that North Americans worry about, Canadians, Americans. So here are some things that we worry about. The future. A lot of people worry about the future, especially younger people. What does the future hold for, for me? I mean, who am I going to marry? Uh, where am I going to go to school? What's my job going to be? What does the future... I mean, I think this day, as the national debt rises, what is my future? I think the younger generation is thinking about that more known. There's a lot of unknown questions. And so there's a worry. What about my future? So we worry about our future. People worry about their past. The, they have regrets about things that they can't even change. And so they dwell on the past. They worry about what they've done. They worry about the past. And so that's another worry. You know, if only I did it differently. So there's worry there. You know what else people worry about? People worry about money. And one of the big things that people worry about these days is, will I have enough? Is there enough? I mean, with my budget and the cost of living going up and my, my income, will I have enough? So people worry about their money and managing their money. People worry about their health. People really worry about their health. We, we'll, we'll go on. We'll leave that one. Worry about your health. People worry about job security, of whether my job will, will continue, whether I'll be able to stay in this job and be employed in this area. People worry about relationships with people. People worry, here's the seventh thing, people worry about what other people think. So seven things that people worry about. These are uh, the seven biggest worries for people, I would say, in North America based on the stats that I've read. Now, some of you are looking at these, this list, and you're thinking, yes, I struggle with some of these areas, but there are some of you sitting here and you're like, Pastor, I'm worried about all seven of them. Thanks for bringing them up this morning. I came to church. You've really made my day. I'm looking at your list, Pastor, and I wasn't worried before, but now I'm worried because you brought them up for me. Folks, we're going to have a solution as we, as we look at what God's Word has to say about how we can manage worry. Now, let me say, let me say by the way, whenever we are anxious or worried about things, it affects us, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, but 
let's just talk about physiologically. Let's talk, one of the things that affects us, one of the areas it, it affects us actually is your physical appetite. It actually affects you. Now, it has, it has the, the opposite effect depending on how you deal with worry and stress and anxiety. For some of you, you completely lose your appetite and you don't want to eat anything. You have a nervous st stomach and that's the way it affects you physically. For other people, it accelerates your appetite and you want comfort food so you eat more when you're stressed and when you're worried. So it actually affects people in different ways. I was thinking about that for myself. You know, I was thinking... Now, you may not agree with me on this, but when I worry, um, you know what, folks? You may be surprised, but I actually lose my appetite. You shocked? You're shocked. I'm shocked, too. My wife's really shocked about that. I, I, I do. When I'm really worried, when I'm really intense about something, I lose my appetite. I, I really lose uh, my desire for food. And you say, wow, wow. You, you know, no. Now, probably you're saying and you're thinking, Pastor, with your side, obviously you don't worry very much, Right? Well, I have an answer to that for you this morning. Well, I have to say, once I've wrestled through my worry and reached the other side, if you will, I have no problem catching up on what I missed. How's that? How's that? <laughs> so it affects our appetite. So some people, they lose their appetite. Some people gain an appetite. For others of you, though, when you get worried, as I said, you, you binge on food. Steak and pie and ice cream and chips and chicken and whatever. There's a reason for all of that. Did you know there was a reason for that? How many people want to know the reason why that is the case? Okay, I have a reason for you this morning. Here's the reason. Because when you're stressed, and you've got to listen to this very closely, when you're stressed and you eat all of that, did you know, did you know stress spelled backwards is actually what? It's actually desserts. Did you know that? Stress... Spelled backwards is actually desserts. And so, anyways, it's, that's for free this morning. Something to think about. It's not even funny, but anyways, I just, it, it is true. Stress spelled backwards is actually desserts. So that's why, that's, that, that's why you go heavy on desserts, maybe. But however you deal with it, we need to, the fact is, we struggle with worry, and we need to learn how to deal with anxiety and worry. Let me give you two quotes before we give you some ideas on how you can deal with it. Dr. Charles Mayo, co-founder with his brother of Mayo Clinic, he said, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system is affected by worry. I love this quote by Corrie Ten Boom. Listen to this one. She once said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Isn't that true? It actually takes your strength away. And so how can I fight against worry? How can we deal with worry? Well, here's some suggestions for you this morning if you're taking notes. First of all, we need to take captive every thought. We need to take captive every thought. Worry is a battle. And the battlefield is actually in your mind. Because it first comes into your thoughts and the things that we are anxious about and, 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 and are worrisome to us and so, therefore, we have to do battle in our minds. And you say, Pastor, where do you get that in the Bible? Well, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, listen to what he says. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We'll stop there for a minute. Listen to the battle language there. He's talking about the war that, that we're fighting and the weapons that we have to fight this war. And he's not talking about a physical war. He's talking about an internal spiritual conflict. That's what he's talking about. And so he goes on to say in verse 5, watch what he says. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Apostle Paul says that. What he is saying to us is, through God's help and grace and power, we have the weapons to fight this battle. Weapons that the world doesn't have, if they don't know God, they don't have the weapons they need. And the weapon is really the help of the Holy Spirit, to take captive every thought that is dishonoring to God. That is what we have. That includes any sinful thoughts, 
But in the context of what we're talking about here, taking captive of worry and anxious thoughts, taking captive those thoughts. This is where it all begins. There's a battle that goes on in our mind to control us, and we have to rein in our thoughts, because if we don't, our thoughts will take us to very dark places that you don't want to go. So how do you rein in your thoughts with the help of the Holy Spirit? I think it starts by identifying areas of concern, I think it involves confessing them to God. Lord, being honest with God, these thoughts that I'm wrestling through of worry and anxious thoughts, Lord, this thought right now that is flooding in my mind is not of you. It doesn't glorify you. I take it captive in Jesus' name. I want to dismiss it in Jesus' name. You're identifying, you're confessing it, you're getting it out in the open to be able to deal with it. So that's the first thing you need to do is to take, to deal with worry, is to take captive every thought. So what do we do then? What do you do with it then? That's a good question. We need to, secondly, secondly, we need to lean into our Heavenly Father. Now follow me with this. We need to lean into our Heavenly Father, which is, is God. Now, this is right here in Luke chapter 12. I want to point out a couple of verses here. I love the way that Jesus says in verse 24, that God feeds the birds, the ravens. In verse 28, God clothes the wildflowers. Now, the New Testament is originally, originally written in Greek. So when Jesus says God here, it's written, God in Greek means theos. Theos. Theos means, it means majestic, all-powerful. So those first two verses, he's emphasizing God is being all-powerful. God is being majestic. God will feed the birds. God will clothe the lilies. God, Theos, who is all-powerful, is able to do that. The God that we serve is majestic. So that's the way he begins. He wants people to see God as being all-powerful and all-majestic. God, that's where he begins. But then he transitions later down in verse 30, and he says, and by the way, your father knows that you need these things, and he changes from God, Theos, to Father, which means in the Greek, Papa or, or Daddy. It's, it's, an, it's an, a personal name for God. You have a Father in heaven. He, he moves it from the powerful, majestic God, which God is, and he brings it down to a very close, intimate relationship with him. A Father that's not distant from us, that's not only all-powerful, but a father who knows our needs and will take care of us. And so what he wants us to do and what God wants us to do is he wants us to begin to lean into him, begin to trust him, begin to point our thoughts to him. That's what he wants. So we're focusing on fear and worry. We're taking captive a thought. You know, taking captive a thought is identifying it. And, and confessing it, but what should we do once we identify the area of thought that is so destructive? How do we deal with that thought? Should we just tell ourselves not to think that way? You know, stop thinking that way. Well, folks, what happens when you tell yourself to stop thinking a certain way? What, do you, what happens there? You end up thinking that way. That's called thought repression. I, I shouldn't think this way. Well, the more you say it to yourself, the more you're going to be thinking about it, of course. So what do you do once you've identified areas where your thinking is destructive? What you need to do is not repress it. What you need to do is replace it, which is called thought replacement. Thought replacement, which is exactly what you're doing when you begin to focus your attention on God, when you begin to lean into your heavenly Father, you begin to take your focus off the issue and you begin to focus on God, you're my heavenly Father. You begin to reflect on him and his goodness and you press into him and feel as it were his loving arms around you. That's what you're doing when you're leaning into God. And so... That's the second thing you need to do. You need to take your thought captive, you identify it, I, I, I confess it, and then I shift my focus to my Heavenly Father say, God, I can't deal with this myself. 
God, you're with me. God, I need to bring everything to you. I need to cast my cares on you. I need to lean into God. That's what it's talking about here. And recognize that he's not only all-powerful, but he's your father who cares about you, who is an ever presence and help in time of need. Amen? So that's the second thing we need to do. How many are still with me? So here comes the third thing we need to do if we're going to deal with destructive thoughts like worry and anxiety. Here's the thing, third thing we need to do to fight against worry. We need to watch this. Watch this. We need to pray it through until you get God's peace. Okay, so you're taking it a step further. You're leaning into God, but you're going to take it a step further. You're going to begin to talk to God. You're going to pray it through until you get peace. And so you say, Pastor, what does that look like? Well, in Philippians chapter 4, four Paul would write this, be anxious for nothing. Be na- anxious for nothing. The word anxious there in Philippians chapter 4 is the same Greek word we're talking about here that we're talking about in Luke chapter 12. Be anxious for nothing, listen to the rest of the verse, but in everything, say everything, everything Everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God, and there it is, and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We need to pray it through until we gain God's peace. Gain God's peace. Now listen to me on this, folks. When Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he uses two words. He says, prayer and supplication. Prayer and supplication. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything that troubles you, everything that worries you, through prayer and supplication. The word prayer basically means to commune, to to, to connect with God, to begin to talk to God. Have conversation. Pour your heart out to God. That's prayer. Identifies it prayer. Okay? But then he says this word called supplication. Supplication is a different word. And with that, the connotation is petition or request. So we invited to make our requests known to God. But listen, it's prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Always giving thanks and praise to God for who he is and what he has done. He's your father in heaven who loves you. He has your best interest in mind. So as you're praying, as you're communing, as you're connecting, and you're making your quest, always, you know, season it with thanksgiving because the Bible says that. And then it tells us something, folks. It tells us something. You need to read the whole verse to see, if you do this, there'll be good consequences. If you don't do this, there'll be bad consequences. So watch the promise that comes here. A promise from God's word. And then it tells us, you know, it tells us, to the, and he tells us the promise. Here's the promise. Watch it. Here it is. And the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds In Christ Jesus. He's saying, pray through, talk to God, petition with thanksgiving, and God promises us peace. Isn't that what we really need? Isn't that what you really need when (sighs) consumed with worry, don't know what to do? That's what we really need. In the midst of adverse circumstances where our hearts could be so consumed with feet, fear, doubt, and worry, so consumed, but God promises to give us peace. That that peace really communicates a wholeness within our soul. And if we're honest, it's your, your worry affects your whole being, and so peace does too. When you begin to experience the peace of God, you affects you physically, mentally, emotionally. Peace within your soul, a wholeness, a wholeness he gives you. And again, that's exactly what we need during those times of adversity. And that's what God offers to us for those of us that will press into him, bring everything to him, commune with him, talk with him, thank him, petition him. He brings divine peace. How many have experienced that? Amen. Yes, I've I've talked to people, you know, in circumstances where 
you know, on, in the natural realm, you know, you think, you, you think that they should be falling apart. I, and, and, you know, you talk to them, you say, do you understand your diagnosis? Do you understand what you're dealing with? Yes, I understand, Pastor. But I just have peace in my soul. It comes from praying through. It really does. Peter would say something very similar when he said, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. He cares for you. There was a, a hymn written in 1904 about this verse. It's entitled, God Will Take Care of You. I was reading a little bit about that the last few weeks. It was written by uh, Savella Martin. She was a pastor's wife who was dealing with some troubling adversity in her life. Her, I guess her husband was a pastor. They were dealing some, with some challenging things. And actually wrote this hymn in the midst of adversity. But as you listen to this hymn, you'll discover that she really leaned into this truth and the, the truth of praying through, you can sense as you listen to the lyrics of the song, you can really sense that she's leaned into God, she's talked to God, and God has given her an amazing peace. And as a result, she writes this song, God will take care of you. The stanzas go like this. Listen to what she says, the first verse. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Second verse. Through days of toil, when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When danger spheres your path assail, God will take care of you. Third verse. No matter what the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. The chorus says, God will take care of you through every day. Over all of the way, he will take care of you. We're going to sing that in just a minute. Marilyn's going to come. You can come to the piano, Marilyn. I just want you to bow your heads. And in this quiet moment, I want that truth to sink into your soul. Because there are people here this morning that are struggling with worry and fear and doubt anxious thoughts that are consumed. And I just want that truth to penetrate your soul with a recognition in the midst of what you're dealing with now that God will take care of you. A knowledge, an awareness, no matter what I'm facing, that God will take care of me. But I don't know what I'm going to do. I have decisions to make. I'm facing challenges in my life, Pastor. Let's, let's let that... Let's let that truth sink into our souls today. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. That's the message today. We take captive every thought, make it obedient to Christ, the thoughts that are consuming us and destroying us. We confess those things. We, we begin to lean into our Heavenly Father who will take care of us. And we begin to talk to him and we begin to petition him and we give him thanksgivings and go, as we do those things, the promise that comes from God's word is there's a peace that comes to our soul. A peace that passes all understanding that will guard our heart and mind. And there are people in this place that need to experience that peace. And I pray that, Lord, as they do that this morning, that they would begin to experience your wonderful Oh, I pray for that today. Minister to our hearts and our souls. We don't always know what's going on in each other's life, in our minds. And we go through battles. We come to church and nobody knows. But God, you know and you care and you will take care of us. No matter what we're facing, you will take care of us. I'm so thankful for that truth this morning. Hallelujah. I'm going to invite you to stand. And you may not know this song, but Marilyn's going to lead it for us. And as, if you do know it, sing along. If you don't, just hum along. Eventually sing along. Pastor Marilyn, lead us in this hymn. Be not dismayed,
first time I've heard it. I was reading about it. That's quite a, quite a story if you want to Google it. Thank you, Pastor Marilyn, for leading us. Somebody know that God will take care of you. Amen. Amen. And we need to plant that in our soul and remember that as we leave this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us. Thank you for reminding us of that truth as we go out into life and we experience life and the challenges and, and all the things that come on us. Help us, Lord, to remember that God will take care of us, will look after us, and we can trust him with our life and our future and all of our decisions. We commit our life to him today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a great day.